I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So the context for me here is that in America, as you probably know, uh, we had an election. And the results of that election, as best we can gather, are about 51.7%, nearly 52%, and the votes are still being counted, of American voters have re-elected Donald Trump. And many people are celebrating that victory, a, ma a majority, clearly, of American voters. And many others, including me, are not celebrating it. Um, we can accept the results of an election, which I certainly do. I accept that Donald Trump will become the next American president, my next American president. And um, we can accept that while still being concerned. And I'm going to speak to those of us who have concerns. If you don't have concerns, that's OK. You might be interested in applying this material to other areas of your life where you do have concerns. Or you might uh, find use here for friends and family who do have concerns. You don't share their concerns, but you can be concerned that they're concerned because you care about them and have compassion. Uh, and so you might find you know, some value here. Uh, if none of that speaks to you, there's really no need to stick around. Uh, and uh, definitely no need to, you know, to send me an angry email uh, complaining that I've uh, been dealing with this topic tonight. Okay, here we go. I have four major headlines here, and they come from my own practice. Uh, the first of them is to strengthen the heart. You know, when it feels like the bottom has fallen out, at least that's how you experience it, even if the person sitting next to you is really happy. But for you, the bottom has fallen out. And we begin with our own experience always. And when that happens, turn to the heart. Turn to the heart. Um, for starters, be kind to yourself, especially if you feel that the world is letting you down, if, you're, if you feel that others who have decision-making power in a democracy have let you down. Uh, it's especially important to stand up for yourself. Be for yourself. Let yourself feel what you're feeling. That's always primary, absolutely primary. Um, but you can still be on your own side. Feel what you're feeling. Take your time with it. Be loyal to yourself. You know, it's really important. I'd certainly recommend it in so many traditions to find and stay in touch with, as much as you can, a sense of your own deep down innate worth as a being, simply by virtue of being. You know, I see a tree there and I go, what a beautiful tree. There it is. Uh, it's worthy. And yeah, there are a thousand or a million other trees and still that tree has its own place, its own time, uh, its own efforts to come into being and to continue to be. Whew, beautiful tree, good tree. Well, we can feel that way about ourselves. Also, protect your heart. It's really important to keep attention, especially these days, away from what are toxic influences for you. It's one thing to uh, give the world sort of the minimal necessary amount of attention to you know, feel like you know what's happening fundamentally, and I'll speak to that in a bit. But you know, speaking for myself, certainly, I just started observing that I'd be reading stuff in my favorite political Twitter feed, and essentially it was all the same. Statements of outrage and um, analytics about this or that, and hooray for our team. Okay, I got it, but after the hundredth or thousandth time of that, I just don't need to engage that anymore. So be careful, guard your own sense doors. As the Buddha taught long ago, for me, one of the most useful personal statements of the Buddha, as best we know, that have come down to us across 25 centuries, all kinds of painful thoughts and feelings can move through awareness, but we don't have to let them invade the mind and remain. So as I said a moment ago, guard the sense doors. You know, what are you listening to? 
What are you seeing? What are you watching? This does not mean a spiritual bypass or overlooking what's problematic. It means finding that sweet spot for you, including watching your own tendency to ruminate. Protect your heart. Protect yourself. Also, of course, try to keep your heart open. Love your friends and family and love our big, beautiful, precious world. Love heals and feeds us, whether it is flowing in or flowing out. This is one of the most important findings in science in the last 10 years, corroborating what's been well known throughout traditions around the world, including in the indigenous traditions of native people. Love heals us and feeds us whether it is flowing in or flowing out. There may well be a lack, understandably, of care and support and appreciation and kindness for you. Uh, the, the rougher your current conditions, the more the world is letting you down and kicking you in the teeth, the more helpful it is to you in your own self-interest to find ways to experience compassion and kindness friendliness and love authentically as it's available to you for those for whom you can feel that. Um, it's good for you to do that. Uh, meanwhile, with others who are draining or upsetting or otherwise, you can have compassion for them while stepping back or standing up for yourself. Uh, it's been remarkable for me personally to appreciate the fact that uh, for people who upset me, and I'm outraged by and I have moral judgment about and there's no escaping from moral judgment. Um, I find for myself that I feel better, me, when I have compassion for their suffering. Compassion is not agreement. It's not approval. It is not waiving your rights. It is not knuckling under, not being a doormat, not being a pushover. We can be very strong while simultaneously looking over there at that person, being aware of some of the many causes and conditions that are leading them to make the choices they're making, um, and deep down, continuing to wish them well while opposing them fiercely. That's possible, it's really possible. Uh, routinely recommended by the great teachers, <laughs> you know, and, I, and I take some guidance from them as well as my own direct experience. See for yourself. Finally, this is something that's been very real for me recently. We are all wounded. No one makes it out of this life without injury. That's a fact. Um, that's not a way of saying, boo ya, let's all be wounded and let's all wound each other. No, there are enough natural wounds that are coming our way. Uh, and in the lives of some people, there's a lot of wounding, vastly more than I've experienced myself. If you're like me, People have let you down. And if you've had it worse than me, maybe people have let you down traumatically and horribly, cruelly and viciously. Maybe you've been attacked, you know, horribly in various ways. Also, in addition to those kind of wounds, we all make mistakes and carry the wounds of regret and remorse. And we've all had losses. We all will have losses, such as doors closing, loved ones dying, or the loss uh, uh, dashed hopes uh, for a better future. So we can be honest about our wounds. We're not trying to bypass them. And we can feel them alongside love. This is remarkable. Try it. Carry your wounds into love. Take your wounds into love. See what that feels like. Find what is authentic for you related to my words. Find your own words. And I think what you will discover is that as you carry your wounds into love, that the wounds soften and become more bearable. You're not denying them. You're carrying them into something bigger. And as we carry our wounds into love, we open out into a field of love while still being wounded with an open heart for others who are wounded as well. Um, next big suggestion, see clearly. Recognize what is not clear seeing, at least as far as you know. Recognize deliberate lying. Recognize deliberate misinformation or disinformation. Um, recognize people who think nothing 
of lying through their teeth. If their lips are moving, they're lying to you. Uh, recognize this. It's not that hard. It's actually pretty easy to get basic factual information from Wikipedia or university websites and credible news organizations that correct their errors. Sure, be open to alternative points of view, but you know, gradually over time, see what you can trust. Recognize the facts that are relevant to you, right? Close at hand, how are the people doing that you care about? What's really come forward for me, you know, in the last 12 hours is a recommitting and a reintensification of my commitment to other people. See how they're doing, right? Many people, um, you know, everybody has a secret struggle, I think. I don't care what your position in society is in your own way. And many people are carrying much bigger loads than I am. And um, it's really a good thing to be aware of how they're doing. Also, how are you doing? You know, when things fall apart in the outer world, it's especially important to take a look at how you're doing over here. How's your health? How are your finances? You know, how's your well-being? Um, what's, what's good for you? Seeing clearly there. And farther afield, are actual harms truly heading your way? All right? As Maya Angelou has said, when people show you who they are, uh, believe them the first time. Now I'm going to exercise my privilege here as uh, the leader of this event and offer a fact statement that I believe is clearly factual. Uh, certainly I and many others have underestimated the movement toward authoritarianism in America over the last 40 years, accelerating really over the last 10. And in addition to that underestimating, I and many others have overestimated the guardrails against that movement toward authoritarianism. That's my personal view. You might disagree. If my personal view is accurate, let's not make those mistakes any longer. It's a plain fact, not alarmism, that America is already several steps down the well-worn path historically toward tyranny. Many people, many great historians um, who know much more about this than myself, such as Anne Applebaum and Timothy Snyder, have a lot of wonderful and accessible material that you might be interested in. In terms of seeing clearly, we do not know their timing and shape, but we do know that storms are coming. So be prepared. And in my third headline here, do what you can. I feel so touched by uh, Nikosi Johnson, uh, this little boy born in South Africa in 1989, born with HIV, who acquired AIDS. And in his lifetime, which lasted 12 years, uh, he became an advocate for people with HIV AIDS, and especially children. And he became a national figure in South Africa. Uh, in the piece that I sent out, um, I have the Wikipedia link to his entry. And to slightly paraphrase something he once said, as he put it, do all that you can with what you've been given in the place where you are in the time that you have. And I just feel if that little boy can see can be that courageous and that wise, and that large-hearted, you know, I have no excuse <laughs> not to do what I can with what I've been given, which is a lot, and in the place where I am, and with the time that I have. And may that be an inspiration, and perhaps even a standard, and an encouragement uh, for others as well. So the more uncertain and potentially threatening the wider world, the more important it is to do what you can and invest in yourself and in the circle around you. What feeds you? Maybe it's time to up your game in self-care. What do you see out in the world that um, you love to see? Beauty, art music, 
perennial wisdom. Um, I'm very fond of uh, many videos on YouTube. My tastes are fairly eclectic, you know, <laughs> from rock climbing videos to San Francisco 49ers highlights to good music to um, weird quantum physics to, um, gosh, <laughs> you know, trailers for movies and all the rest and probably a lot more weird stuff too. Anyway, um, what? You know, what feeds you? Meditation uh, certainly feeds me. I remember uh, um, Father um, Thomas Keating, uh, the founder, certainly the popularizer of, um, it's going to come to me in a second, prayer, centering prayer. There we go. I heard him give a talk once, and he said, you know, a life without contemplative practice is the sure prescription for disaster. All right. So anyway, what feeds you, you know? What protects you? What makes you happy? It's boring but true. We get back what we put in to our diet, to our exercise and other physical activities, and to our meditation and other inner practices. Also, in terms of do what you can, in times that, at least for many people, seem very alarming, um, I remember seeing this YouTube video because I have a little bit of a, hmm, what are we going to do <laughs> if it really gets crazy, as it occasionally has historically. Um, or I remember seeing this YouTube clip of this big, burly, kind of grim, you know, blunt, former U.S. military special forces uh, expert on survival, okay? And he was asked, you know, if uh, when the oatmeal hits the fan under the worst circumstances, you know, what's the most important thing to have? And I was thinking he would answer stuff like a certain rifle or a crossbow or bomb shelter. And his one word answer simply was friends. That's the most important thing to have. So this is the time to really talk with people and listen. You know, a lot of shouting at each other. Can we listen? I don't mean knuckling under and, you know, getting all caught up in bridging differences with people who have no interest in um, traffic flowing both ways. Uh, and, you know, friends, family, those you can relate to, younger people maybe who haven't yet formed their, you know, mind. Um, listen, talk. Deepen friendships, take care of those who are close to you, you know, be loving. Find common ground and ask yourself, okay, in the time that you do have, what could be deepened or even repaired in important relationships? Out in the world, out in the world, pick the causes you care about and support them. Whatever rings true for you. Uh, I have myself founded the Global Compassion Coalition. I put my heart into it a lot of time in the last several years, a couple of years. Um, I remember uh, being um, having the opportunity to be with a U.S. congressperson uh, shortly after the 2016 election. Uh, I'll protect that person's privacy, and I happen to be in a lucked into a small group of people uh, right after um, Hillary Clinton uh, lost that election and Donald Trump won in 2016. And we were all kind of alarmed given our views. Not everyone would agree with those views. In any case, we asked that person, "What do you recommend?" And they said something I've never forgotten. They said, send money to lawyers. In other words, send money to public interest legal firms that can uh, slow down bad things and maybe even prevent them altogether. That's one example. It's up to you. It's up to you. And again, this is in a context in which you, you're concerned about where things are going. Um, your petitions your signatures, um, your money may not make a discernible difference out there in the world, but they will definitely make a discernible difference for you. So that's my third major headline. Do what you can. Do what you can. And then finally, find peace. Find peace. Um, throughout history, most people have lived under really tough conditions. While still, as much as they can, you know, a peasant in what is now Romania in Central Europe or in China 
a thousand years ago or anywhere else in the world, Africa, you know, people living in really tough conditions, uh, people living under the thumb or the boot of some autocrat, some king, some warlord, occasionally a queen, um, they found ways. Not perfectly, I'm not trying to minimize the horror show when it was that, I'm just trying to say, it, for me at least, it helps me find peace and perspective to realize that uh, many, 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 many people have found a way to make a good enough life under really difficult conditions. And if they could do it, we can too. Uh, it's helpful to also appreciate in terms of finding peace that actually most things are out of our control. I look at current political events um, in light of 300,000 years of existence as a human species, only roughly 3% of which, the last 10,000 years, have been in larger population groups, eventually cities and now 8 billion people on planet Earth, that um, you know, are completely historically unprecedented compared to the small groups of 40 to 50 people that we evolved to spend our lives with, in which it was impossible to have a, a warlord inside the band. Yeah, against other bands, sure, but inside the band, no, it wasn't possible. It wasn't possible for rumors to spread deliberately inside the band. Um, our fates were bound together, and there were the three, these three conditions objectively inside the bands common truth, common welfare, and common justice. The way we live for the last 10,000 years, including the last 10, are a complete aberration from the biological template of common truth, common welfare, and common justice, the conditions for which have just been blown up over the last 10,000 years, including the last 10. So that's the world in which we live. We have to do what we can with it, but those are some of the causes and conditions that have had a role in the most recent political events, you know, in the world. And, you know, it's simply a fact that, you know, I live in a country in which, gosh, something like 150 million people vote. I get one vote. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I can't make them, you know, vote my way. Um, even if I could, I'm, I'm not sure I would try because of the deeper issues with that. So, you know, there's a kind of peacefulness in recognizing that we can do all that we can to water the fruit tree, but we cannot make it give us an apple. We can tend to the causes, but we cannot control the results. And there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of not knowing. And peace comes from accepting this fact while doing all that we can to see clearly and to take effective action accepting uncertainty and not knowing. Specifically, what brings you to peace? A couple of people noted that I made a reference to the fact that raising the gaze to the horizon, and also, by the way, getting a sense of things as a whole, is neurologically calming. Uh, you can read more about why that is in my book, Neurodharma. I think it's the chapter on opening into allness, chapter eight, and um, I'll leave it at that. It's also true that as we exhale slowly, that engages the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system. You know, that is soothing and calming and brings us to peace. Tuning into the internal sensations in your body, interoception, neurologically, engages the insula, which acts like a circuit breaker, reducing activity in the default mode network of the brain, which is the, the neurological basis for the inner ruminator or simulator. What's going on in the simulator inside, right? Because what's going on there gets gradually reinforced in your brain since neurons that fire together can wire together as well, especially if they're negatively biased. So, you know, look for what brings you to peace uh, neurologically. I think it's also really important to look around and you can do it right now and, and see so many things that are unaffected by the latest political ups and downs. Trees reach for the sky, birds fly, friends cook dinner together, people laugh, children, you know, have a sense of wonder, uh, love keeps flowing. Um, turn toward what is reliable. Um, you might say that the central arc 
of the Buddha's life as a great teacher. And see for yourself what speaks to you. The central arc of his own journey was toward what is an increasingly reliable and ultimately unconditioned, not subject to rising and passing away, neither born nor passing away, um, an increasingly reliable basis for the ultimate lasting happiness. So in our own life, we can look for what is reliable. Turn toward whatever for you are reliable sources of well-being and comfort and wisdom. You know, uh, the taste of uh, chocolate or a banana, uh, that look in your dog's eyes who wants to go for a walk with you, uh, the you know comfort in a hug, the kindness of a friend, um, deep teachings from the wisdom traditions around the world. For me, uh, I really appreciate the onward developments of science, uh, you know, and also just the wild random beauty all around us sometimes, you know, like the shimmer of a rainbow in a bit of, you know, oil sitting in a, in a puddle uh, next to your home. Um, look for what gives you comfort. Also, in your mind, as I finish here, is the ongoing stability that's inherently untroubled of awareness itself. Trouble passes through awareness. Trouble sometimes passes through my awareness. But awareness itself is always untroubled. Just like um, the screen of a television or a monitor of some kind, itself is not affected or changed by what passes through it, by what it represents. Right? Uh, to paraphrase Pema Chodron, you are the sky. Everything else is just the weather. And even more deeply, uh, if you look, there is a fundamental stillness in your own ground of being. You might have gotten in touch with a bit of that in our meditation here. Slow down. Be gentle with yourself. And you can usually find this, this inner quiet between and beneath the busy thoughts and feelings and desires. That fundamental stillness, which for me, in, in, in my experience and my view, reaches mysteriously into a kind of fundamental stillness in the ground of reality altogether, um, a timeless vastness in which conditioned reality unfolds. Um, if you look, you can find that stillness in your own being, inherently in your own being, um, around which activity and noise proceeds. But stillness itself is uh, that inner peace is um, you, uh, unmade by you and cannot be destroyed by you. Right? It's never lost, but it is often found. Uh, infused with love, that peacefulness is our true home. It's a reliable refuge and a source of strength under all conditions. Uh, including sometimes an unreliable and scary world. To finish, your own practice, your own efforts will help many others beside yourself. They do ripple out into the world. They do touch the lives of others. They do spread in ways known and unknown, seen and unseen, including touching my own life as well. So truly, from my heart, I thank you. I thank you for your practice, your, your attention, your efforts over time, your own good heart, and your sincerity uh, and good faith, including how you are in this gathering. Truly, thank you. So I'm going to speak to some of the things that have most come in, and you might be able to see them in the chat. So 19 minutes past the hour, Therese writes, and I'll use your name if you use your name. If you chat me privately, I won't use your name. So Therese writes, speaking, I think, for many, many people, I'm surprised by the extent of my sadness. I thought I was prepared to brace for this, but far from it. I feel unconsolable and restless, very restless. Absolutely fundamental to any kind of wise practice with the mind is being able to be with what is there. Now we may need to work with the mind to grow inner resources like perspective and resilience and 
what's called distress tolerance and self-soothing and self-compassion and other things to be able to be with what's there. But most fundamentally, we be with what's there. We allow the sadness. We allow brokenheartedness. And whatever is real for you, whatever is real for you, that person next to you who voted differently may not be experiencing that. And it doesn't matter because what they're experiencing has a kind of validity for them and what you're experiencing has a validity for you. So we make room for it. We let it flow. Um, maybe we touch it and we move on. Myself, um, I feel deeply connected to both the people in my country and the people in the world as well as a sense of creatures altogether and I'm deeply concerned about the impact on them most of whom are much more vulnerable and living with much more precariousness than I do. I'm really concerned about them. And, um, you know, I have to take breaks from that alarm. I have to take breaks from, you know, a moral view and take a breath and watch a cat video <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or just get something done like the dishes. So it's okay to take breaks. You know, we empty the bucket of tears one spoonful at a time. But it's really important to include and to feel what we feel and then to notice what is also true. I have a kind of simple three step, you know, practice I do, which is to deal with the bad. I don't necessarily mean it morally. I mean, deal with what's difficult, deal with what hurts, deal with what where the pain is, deal with the bad, um, including conditions you're trying to improve, and turn to the good. Not to avoid the bad, but if anything, to help you cope with it more effectively. Turn to what is also true, that is nurturing, reassuring, at a minimum neutral, hopefully positive. Turn to the good, and then third, take in the good. Let those experiences reverberate in your mind for a breath or longer so they have a chance to hardwire into your brain. Take in the good, to grow the good that lasts inside. All right. Turn, Deal with the bad, turn to the good, take in the good, again and again and again. Okay. Uh, practices of many, many kinds work for different people. Um, you know, I know something about the underlying why, but, you know, of some of them, but I won't go into those details here. So chanting things like Namioho Rinkenkyo uh, in Pure Land Practice, like Jennifer talks about at 19 minutes past the hour, mo many, many kinds of chanting. Uh, in many, many kinds of traditions. I still remember doing the fire walk with Tony Robbins back in 1980. Two, I don't know, maybe roughly, and saying, cool moss, cool moss, cool moss, while I walked across the red hot coals. Uh, you know, so find what works for you. Okay. I find um, that there really is a place for being civil while also having self respect and speaking with moral confidence and gravity. There are many people in the world who are models of that. Um, I like the way Kyle Shanahan talks <laughs> after a game in which the 49ers have lost, a uh, football team. Uh, you know, he carries a certain weight. He's telling what's true. Uh, he's not pulling his punches, but he's also not adding a, a lot of topspin to it. There's a way, there's a way to do that. I'll tell you a little thing here. Um, I was recently on a retreat in the kind of in the mountains in uh, Utah, southern Utah, and uh, I would often look around, and I can do that now where I am, and I'll see trees that that uh, were planted from a seed well before I was born, and that will live well after my lifespan. And there's something about all that that gives me comfort. I mean, my heart does ache for what factually, human activity, particularly with greenhouse gases, is doing to this planet. My heart aches, and I know that Earth will endure. Personally, I think our species, uh, you know, is more likely to be roughly in the midpoint of its 300,000 years so far ultimate lifespan than toward the end. Um, that doesn't mean I'm at all happy about the terrible consequences and the centuries ahead. 
uh, you know, but I myself get comfort by a sense of our little precious planet, you know, as a blue-green marble in the sky. And it's a big, big universe. Life's been cooking away here on Earth for well over three and a half billion years. And that kind of stuff gives me personally a sense of perspective. While also going to bed every day, usually, with a sense of wasn't perfect, but pretty good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> made efforts, brought the heart to it, and learned along the way. And I think those are the big three, in my view, that we can judge ourselves by each day and find comfort in. You know, did you bring your heart to it reasonably? You know, maybe some room for improvement tomorrow. Did you bring your heart to it? Did you try? Again, not white knuckling or sweat popping out of your forehead, but did you hang in there? Did you put in a good day's work given the amount of energy you and health you actually have? What's really true for you? You know, an honorable amount of effort, uh, including toward other people. And did you learn something? Did you repair something? Did you heal something? Did you realize something? Did you grow in some way? Um, wholeheartedness, efforts, and learning. Someone asked me a question that I think is really in the minds of many people. And it's relevant for me with some of my relatives who I like as people, uh, who believe things that I'm very clear are absolutely untrue and uh, are deeply invested in um, paths that I find morally abhorrent. And they probably look at me much the same way. So what do we do? First of all, it's, it's not necessary to go for the absolute extreme and then judge yourself because you're not there. You know, in, in Buddhism, you may be familiar, especially in um, Southeast Asian Buddhism, there's, uh, there are these meditative practices in which we deliberately cultivate compassion and kindness for others. And it's in a kind of a, a sick, it's in a, it's in a, it's on a range, right? So often it starts with oneself, although sometimes we do that one last because that's the hardest of all. But let's say you start with yourself and then you choose someone that you really, really like and appreciate, a so-called benefactor. Then you move on to a friend, you know, could be a partner, could be a neighbor you like. Then you move on to someone who's neutral. You don't have strong feelings either way. And then finally, fifth, you get to a difficult person. And typically you start with an easy, difficult person, like, you know, a friend who might be kind of annoying, and then you just work up the ladder. A lot of times people choose peop uh, others who are at the very top of the range of difficulty and then go, ah, how do I do this? No, start small and build from there. It's a little bit like learning to swim. Start in the shallow end and then work your way into the deeper end of the pool. And I find myself what it helps is that we don't have to love so-called uh, the actions or the parts of that person that, for example, get pleasure from hurting others. We don't have to, quote unquote, love those parts, but still, can we look past them to see suffering there? Can we look past them to see the little child uh, deep inside everyone? You may have to look for a very, very little child to find that, but can we do that? And I, for me, that's helpful, uh, including staying aware of the ways in which it helps me not be so stressed or upset by that other person. Okay.